In this video, we'll take a look at some higher level content related to A3.1 on diversity of organisms, specifically species identification. By now, no doubt you've gotten the idea of a species being individuals that can reproduce and form fertile offspring, but there are some difficulties in using this definition of a species, and so that's what we'll focus in on here. One of the difficulties being, what do we do about asexual reproducers? So things like bacteria um, or other organisms that simply make a copy of themselves without um, a partner, how do we test the definition if they are the same species? So for a horse and a zebra, I can see that they can make an offspring, but that that offspring is not fertile, so I know the horse and zebra are not the same species but I can't do that with bacteria or other asexual reproducers, so I don't know how to test if they are the same species or not. The other thing to consider is mutations and minor differences. So we may be able to sequence the genome of two asexual reproducers, and we'll see that there are differences but how do we know at what point new species have formed? How do we know that there's enough differences to consider these different species? And no one is expecting you to have the answers here, um, but it's just we need to recognize that there are limitations to our use of this definition of a species. One of the other interesting things to consider is um, especially bacteria that can do something called horizontal gene transfer. So that works a little something like this. Bacteria can sometimes exchange these accessory loops of DNA called plasmids. And when they do that, that can be incorporated into um, a different species. And now that species has some different traits. It has some different genetic material. Is this a new species? just because it received some new genes? I don't know, <laughs> okay? Um, so again, we're not expected to know the answer here, but we are expected to be able to talk about some of the problems with using this definition of a species. Sexual reproduction and chromosomes and cell division are all topics that are um, discussed more in depth um, in other parts of the curriculum. But because we're talking about species, I wanna dive a little bit deeper into chromosome number being a shared trait. So let's take a look at why that is. During gamete production, that's producing eggs and sperm, um, the chromosome number is reduced by half. And so these chromosomes are not diploid. They don't come in pairs. In gametes, the chromosomes do not come in pairs. They are haploid. So what we get during sexual reproduction is the fusion of two haploid nuclei to produce a zygote. And so what that looks like um, is something like this, to where you have one chromosome from the mom, one chromosome from the dad, and then that would be true for all of the other chromosome pairs, right? So we get these diploid cells, okay, in the zygote from the fusion of these male and female gametes. That ends up with these homologous pairs. So I'll circle one of these. This is an example of a homologous pair, okay? So chromosomes that come in pairs. One of the reasons why the chromosome number does not change within a species, so for example, I have 46 chromosomes, uh, you have 46 chromosomes, humans have 46 chromosomes in general, one of the reasons that doesn't change is because when meiosis is occurring to create these gametes, these homologous pairs have to line up. If these homologous pairs, or if these chromosomes are not in homologous pairs, those gametes, gametes will not be able to form. And so this is one of the things that keeps that chromosome number consistent amongst a species. Now let's say you're out and about and you find a species, or what you think is a species, and you want to identify that. You might use what's called a dichotomous key, right? So di, that prefix di meaning two, this is a key that has a series of yes or no, or either this or that questions to help you identify an organism. So to use a dichotomous key, it would look something like this. If I find something and I know that it's a vertebrate, then I can decide, does it have fur or no fur? If it does not have fur, then I have to decide, does it have feathers or no feathers? If it doesn't have feathers, I have to look at it. Does it have dry skin or moist skin? If it has dry skin, okay, maybe it's a reptile. So these features you'll notice need to be clear and unambiguous. So I can't say, is it big? 
Well, big can mean a lot of different things. I can't say, is it pretty? (laughs) Um, I I also probably shouldn't use internal things. So I might not have a lot of luck if I say, does it have a four-chambered heart? Well, it's kind of hard to use that if it's a living organism, especially out in the wild. So if we have to make a dichotomous key, we want to use clear, unambiguous, and observable traits. They should be yes or no answers. Um, and it can be in the form of a tree diagram like this, um, or just yes or no questions that lead to an answer at the end. Perhaps a more sophisticated way of identifying species is to use a technique called DNA barcoding. So a DNA barcode is a short segment of DNA that we can use to identify a particular species. So I'd be looking for a segment that's really unique to a certain species, and then I can tell if that organism belongs to that species or not. It's very cool. So it allows you to um, identify an organism even if you don't see it, even if that organism isn't physically there. So here's how that might work. Let's say um, I'm looking for these Gouldian finches. Aren't they pretty? (laughs) Um, And so I look at a water hole. I might not see any finches at that water hole at that time, but I want to know if they've been there. So I can collect DNA from the environment. So maybe that's a water sample or something from like a tree. So I might be looking for maybe cells left behind by this organism. I can sequence that DNA and then I can know if those finches have been at the watering hole or not. So it's a really cool use of genomic sequencing.